I hate waiting. I, I don't like waiting. I mean, I, I think most of you probably can relate to that. I mean, I mean do any of us really like waiting? I mean, I, I think about um, when I used to um, go to down to Atlanta, we have Six Flags, you know, like Kings Island. We, we go to Six Flags, and you would wait an hour or more in line for a 30 second ride. And, and it just it seems so useless. You're, I mean, yeah, you're going to have fun on the ride, but man, I. You go to Walmart and only two lines are open, and you're <laughs> waiting, and it just seems so useless. All you can do is just stare at the tabloids and read the headlines and shake your head. I don't know. Other things, but never mind that. But it, I, I just wait, like getting to the beach, you know? When I lived down south, getting to the beach was easy. Here it's, you know, the journey is. Takes all day, the 11 hours of sitting in the car. Waiting's just not my favorite. I wish we just, you know, blink our eyes. I can, I dream a genie, you know, and we're there. Sometimes, yeah, well, always, I, I don't enjoy waiting. I'm impatient. But sometimes waiting's important. Sometimes waiting is necessary. We're going to talk a little bit about waiting today. And I'm preaching it myself as much as anyone, but waiting sometimes is, is critical, sometimes it's valuable. Uh, my son Aiden, my youngest, he is at Taylor uh, University now, just starting through the semester. But Aiden went all the way back, to, Aiden turns 20 here in a, in a few weeks. I can't believe my youngest is going to be 20. Because <laughs> um, I know what that says about me. Uh, but I'm looking at Aiden, and, and I remember all the way back to second grade. Aiden had a teacher named Miss McEwen. And uh, Aiden is a as a child. I, just think, I've told you some stories. Some of you know some of Aiden's story. But Aiden, Aiden was a difficult child. Um, he he was a challenge. Maybe is a better way to say it. Aiden was very challenged. Like Aiden liked to flush wooden trains down the toilet. Unfortunately, they wouldn't make it all the way through. And so it meant I had to take toilets off the floor and clean them out often. And that was those were moments I had to repent of afterwards. Um, but uh, <laughs> things like that. Aiden, I remember one time we go into Aiden's bedroom, and when this was, I don't know, he had only about two years old probably, he had taken an entire bottle of baby powder and he covered himself in it. And his entire room was just white. His entire, he was just, it was so funny because then he opens his eyes and all you see is these two eyes and they think white. It was, it was, it was, it was funny. We had to laugh, but man, what a mess. Um, I remember what, some other, what are some other things, Cheryl? He, oh, I remember one thing he used to do uh, when I was a youth pastor in church down there. After church every Sunday, when we were all talking, one, I remember one Sunday we noticed what was happening. We looked up, and there's Aiden, and he's going through all the pews, picking up the half-used communion cups and drinking out of them. And he was calling it Jesus juice. <laughs> so, I mean, they, that, was, that was how we saw him, but... Back to Miss McEwen, in second grade, you know, Aiden, was, he was a high energy child, hard to keep up with, and I remember Miss McEwen, because she told us, um, she said, I will just say to Aiden, one day you're going to be a mighty man of God. That was her phrase. You are going to be a mighty man of God, Aiden. And that was her way of convincing herself and Aiden that, to get through that time, but I remember that was something over the years. Whenever Aiden would provide us with a challenge, we, Cheryl and I would remind Aiden, one day you're going to be a mighty man of God, uh, trying to convince ourselves and him. And, and, and we would just say that phrase, and it's kind of become a mantra in our family. And here Aiden is, and, and, and we've been waiting on him to become a mighty man of God. And, and, and in a lot of ways, it's cool because we are seeing it happen in so many ways. And in so many ways, we're still waiting and watching grow and train. But to me, that's a picture of discipleship. That's a picture of what it looks like to grow in the waiting. And that's what I want us to think about today. You see, as followers of Jesus, we are called to wait. And the waiting is valuable. The waiting is important. Here's the thing, if you're following along in your notes today, you can start right here with this. It starts here, it says, we are living between the already and the not yet. That's where we're waiting. All of us as followers of God, followers of Jesus, we are, we are living right now between the 
And we're waiting in between the already and the not yet. And here's what I, I mean by that. You see, already this world has been broken by sin, but not yet has it been made new again. We are waiting. Already Jesus has come, but not yet has he returned to take you to be home with him forever. Already Jesus reigns, but not yet has his final kingdom come. Already sin has been defeated, but not yet has it been completely destroyed. Already the Holy Spirit has been given, but not yet has it been perfectly formed into the likeness of Jesus. Already God has given you his word, but not yet has it totally transformed your life. Already you have been given grace, but not yet has that grace finished its work in you. You see, we are called to wait because we are right in the middle of God's redemptive story. It has already been promised, but not yet has our faith become sight. And I want you to think about that today. We are not called to wait needlessly like we do in an amusement park or in a crowded store. We wait with hope, the hope of God's promise. And we have things to do while we wait. And they're better than standing here reading tabloid magazines. We have things to do as followers of Jesus in our waiting. In, in other words, for followers of Jesus, our waiting is a time of action. So often we associate waiting as a passive time, a time where we're sitting, doing nothing, toiling away, waiting, and spinning and waiting on time just to pass. But as followers of Jesus, our waiting is not like that. Our waiting is a time of action. Jesus teaching, and if you're going to follow along, since we don't have anything on the screens right now, if you want to follow along with your few Bible, or if you brought one with you, or on your phone, go ahead, because Luke, we're going to be in several chapters today, or several different places in Scripture. I'd love for you to be able to follow along, but Luke chapter 12 is where I just want to share with you a little bit of Jesus' thinking here, and what he's sharing. He says, be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning, like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose, masters fi whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or towards daybreak. Jesus is hoping that he finds a church ready, waiting, but doing something. That's what he's looking for. I think about the examples we have in Scripture of people who went through times of waiting, but they didn't do nothing. They were waiting and preparing and training. I think about Moses. I don't know what you know. Moses, back in Exodus, two and three, the beginning of the story that the Hebrews were in slavery in Egypt and, and this this Hebrew woman she she has a baby a baby boy the problem is at that point Pharaoh was very concerned about the Hebrew population these slaves were becoming too many he was afraid they were gonna rise up and overthrow their population in Egypt and so he started slaughtering the boys and Moses was born to this Hebrew woman. And she wants to keep her baby safe, so when he's born, she takes him and she makes this basket of reeds and, and tar, and puts him in the basket and lays him down in the Nile, near where she knew the princess, and the Pharaoh's daughter, and, and some of the others in the, in the palace would come down to, to the water, and she put him there. And sure enough, the, the princess, the Pharaoh's daughter, finds, finds this baby floating in the in the water. And she says, I'm going to take this child and raise him, but I can't, I, I can't take care of him now as an infant. I'm going to go find a, a Hebrew woman to, to nurse him until he's old enough to come live with me. And she goes and she finds his mother. She didn't know him. She raises him and 
So he's old enough to go be in the palace, and then eventually he comes to live in the palace. He's living in Pharaoh's palace. Until one day comes when, when, when this young Hebrew boy being raised as an Egyptian in the palace witnesses an Egyptian beating a, a Hebrew slave. He looks around and there's nobody there. And he tries to break up the fight and he ends up killing the Egyptian in the process. And he realizes he's in trouble now. Pharaoh is not going to be happy, not going to understand. So he flees out to the wilderness where he's going to spend years outside of civilization. He, he, he does meet a family. He, he gets married. He begins a family of his own. And all this time, Moses is learning how to become a man, how to lead, how to follow God. And many years later, as the Hebrew people are being oppressed, Pharaoh dies. His son takes his place. The new Pharaoh is making it even harder on the Hebrews, making life terrible for them. And they begin calling out to God, please rescue us. Please set us free. Deliver us from the hand of slavery. And that's when, that's when God appears to Moses in the form of a bush that would not burn up. It was in flames, but it was not being consumed. And God speaks to Moses and says, the time's now. You've been waiting, but I've got a mission for you. Moses had to wait in that wilderness for a long time. David had to wait. But we see this throughout Scripture. David was anointed as a young boy to become the next king of Israel to follow Saul. But it was years before he was ready to actually do it. Years shepherding sheep in the pasture, going and facing Goliath, joining the, the military, Saul's army, and fighting. Trying to avoid Saul wanting to kill him because he was becoming popular. And all the while, David's growing up. He's waiting for the moment that God called him to, to be king of Israel. Jesus had to wait. Jesus spent 30 years preparing for a three-year ministry that would change the world. Times of waiting are not meant to be wasted. Times of waiting are opportunities for growth, for development. That's what we're here for. That's what discipleship's all about. That's what the church is now. And the question is this, what do we do while we wait? As, a, as the church, as followers of Jesus, what do we do while we wait? Now, I can't think of a better place to look, and, and I know we use this part of the book of Acts a lot, but Acts chapters 1 through 5, through the story of the, of the church, Jesus has been crucified. He's, after he had brought his disciples along and taught them, and now he's been crucified, and he's resurrected, he's appeared to them, and now here in Acts chapter 1, he's getting ready to go back into heaven. He's going to leave them behind. But look at the first words he says to them in, in Acts chapter 1. Verse 8, Jesus is saying, listen, you have some things to do. You're going to be waiting on me to return, but you've got things to do. And he gives them this warning. He says, wait, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He says, you're waiting on something. You are waiting on my Holy Spirit to come give you what you need. And finally, in Acts chapter 2, we see that day come. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, it says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all there, the believers, the followers of Jesus, were together in one place. And suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, as the Spirit enabled them. And they began to proclaim the gospel. And the people thought of the, the people in Jerusalem around them thought of they were going crazy. What are these people doing? Peter stands up and he proclaims, This is who Jesus was. This man you killed. He was Messiah. You missed it. But you can come be a part of it now. Peter had been going through this. And he'd been following Jesus for three years. He was waiting now between Jesus' resurrection and now he's ascended. And now they're sitting there waiting to begin their ministry. I don't know what to do, but Peter did. He, he was waiting on God to prepare him for this moment. And the Holy Spirit comes on him and gives him the power he needs. And he stands up and he proclaims that message. 
And I'm trying to think about how amazing it would have been to have witnessed that. And then we see right after Peter speaks, people were cut to the heart. What do we do? We want to be a part of this. We, we missed Messiah before, but we want a part of that now. And, and it says, as Peter told them, repent, be baptized. Turn to God and give him your heart. Give him your life. And join us in the waiting. Because he's coming again. He said about 3,000 people responded to that. And right after that, here's a text we're familiar with, right? Verses 42 to 47 in Acts chapter 2. They devoted themselves, the church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added their number daily to those who were being saved. They were waiting, but they weren't waiting and wasting. They were doing something about it. And we know the story of that church goes on, they grow. In Acts chapter 3, we see a situation where Peter and John heal a, a lame man from the gates when they were going to pray one day. And it, take, it basically sends the, the crowd into an uproar, and the Jewish leadership's not happy about it. They call Peter and John and say, you better stop talking in that man's name. We killed him for a reason. They said, we don't have any other name to speak in. They couldn't stop him. And the church was growing. And I love this part. In Acts chapter 5, in verses 12 through 16, when it says, The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colony. No one dared to join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered, also from towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits. And all of them were healed. And all of this happened while they were waiting. All of this happened because the Holy Spirit came on them and was guiding them. They, they were training themselves with the apostles' teaching and they were fellowshipping with each other and they had the church and they were encouraging each other and building each other up. All in their way. Guys, that's who we are today as we wait between the already and the not yet. Three things I just want to give you simply today that we do in our waiting. And the first one is this. We learn to depend on the Holy Spirit. Church, we have to learn how to depend on the Holy Spirit. Jesus told them to wait on the Holy Spirit to come for a reason. Now he has. But do you recognize his voice? Do we, church, recognize the voice of the Spirit of God? I love how Paul describes it in Romans chapter 8, verses 25 through 28. Paul says, but if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our faith. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Guys, discipleship first is about learning to listen to the Holy Spirit, learning to recognize the voice of God. It doesn't just happen. It happens with training. It happens with discipleship. Learning to study God's word, to hear his voice as you study. Learning to pray. Learning from those who have already learned to recognize God's voice. That, that's one of the, the things that I really think this 40 days of prayer and fasting is all about. Why I think it's so important is together, we as a church, begin listening and hearing and recognizing the leading of God's Holy Spirit 
We can't do it without him. We will fail if we don't learn to listen to the Holy Spirit. We will. But with him, nothing will stop what God wants to do. It's that simple. That's what discipleship calls us to do, is together, church, learn how to hear and recognize his voice. The second thing that we have to do while we're waiting is this. We pursue growth personally and within the church. We have to pursue growth. We have to pursue spiritual development, discipline. I love that picture that Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47 church they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching to fellowship the breaking of bread the prayer to sharing each other's needs to encouraging each other and building each other up that's what they did while they were waiting they were helping each other grow they were providing opportunities each of those people in their own lives were growing and spending time with God and coming together as the church to help each other and to learn from each other that's what being a part of the church family is about. And I love it that we have, we have every single one of you. I so appreciate and love seeing you here on Sunday morning and worshiping with us. But if that's the extent of what it means for you to be a part of the church family, you're missing out on such an opportunity. Discipleship. To do the waiting with us to be encouraged together to learn from each other that's what discipleship that's what being the church is about that's what that's how we endure this waiting second timothy paul writes some instructions to young timothy this training this learning to lead and paul's mentoring him and in chapter 3, verses 14 through 17, Paul writes, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We have to grow if we want to be transformed. As followers of Jesus, we have to, and that happens in our own lives, and it happens when we're together as the church. And the third thing I want to give you that we must do as, we're, as we grow, as we wait, is we mature into disciple-makers. We mature into disciple makers. Again, I know I've used this passage a lot, but I, I can't get past it. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, again, Paul's writing, he says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith to the knowledge of, son, of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the, the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. And from him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting human, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And guys, that's what we need to think about. That's what we need to talk about as a church. We need to understand and come and start doing. Discipleship is us coming together, helping each other mature and grow so that we're accomplishing that mission of sharing the story, the message, the love of Jesus with world around us making disciples helping disciples mature and grow 